Well, turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 14. And uh, we're going to... We're just going to go ahead and do the completely unordinary, and we're going to pick up right where we left off after I give a brief recap. I mean, you come on, you guys. You have to do that. You have to do a brief recap. Okay, so last week we looked at the diagnosis, uh, the diagnosis, diagnostics, if you will, for the, for the process of leprosy in Leviticus chapter 13. Um, and we looked at some of the ways that leprosy um, showed us really good pictures of sin and the life of sin. And you're going to have to forgive me and pray for the drummers because, man, it's just a whole different world back there. And it's loud and my ears are ringing. So I don't know. I can't hear you. But anyways, uh, we can pray for them. But So leprosy is sin or is a like sin, or is a picture um, of sin in that. And I'm going to recap a few of those things really quickly here. The first one is it begins as really nothing. It begins super small, if you remember that. Like leprosy uh, is painless in its first stages, a lot of times sin is too. You know, the Word of God says that sin is fun for a season, right? Sin's fun for a little while before it begins to do its duties of rotting your flesh, uh, of beginning to decay you. And it grows slowly. Like, like leprosy, sin grows slowly. And it often will even remit for a while. It will go away for a while. And you go, oh, that's no problem. And then it returns stronger. It numbs the senses so that you can't feel the afflicted area. And so like like. Um, leprosy, sin will do the same thing. It'll begin to numb you. You'll begin to grow, what we talked about last week, calloused to where you don't really feel as bad or that conviction when you go to sin. And so it does that same kind of thing and it causes decay, it causes deformity, and it gives a person a repulsive appearance. Also last week, and you know what, well, since we're, last week I didn't, I told you I wasn't going to show you any pictures, but this week I thought I'd go ahead and show you some pictures of leprosy, just because, you know, it, it goes, it, it, it gives us a little bit of insight, and there were some really, really, really bad face ones where the boils were all over the face and the mouth was kind of decaying. I spared you from some of those, but this guy, you can see here in the bottom right corner, his nose is going away, and it's starting to recess there, and and uh, the one on the bottom left, there's a whole another search of like the ones where your, your body turns white and the pigment uh, begins to leave. Um, but I would say the, the average type of leprosy um, that they saw in that day and age was the one where it would begin to attack your hands and your feet and um, begin to put those sores like boil-like sores on you. And so it wasn't a good thing. So it gives a person a, a repulsive appearance, and sin does the same thing. Um, and so here's kind of a, I think, the, I think that's more of a fake one, but it could be real, I don't know. I just thought, man, it's a little bit better to look at for a minute here while we go through this. But another thing that sin, like leprosy, does in our lives is it separates us from fellowship. It cuts us off from the people that really, I would say, we need to be around. We need to be around people that are godly in our lives, <laughs> not worldly. It's so easy to, res to recess in that way, to go the wrong way when we start hanging around with people. I don't know about you, but, you know, you start cutting up. And I, I had the whole thing happen to me, you know, on a job site. One of my first jobs, well, it wasn't my very first one. One of my very first jobs around here, I don't know if I can say this on live YouTube television, but they, uh, they would pay the workers in marijuana. So, and I was like, I want money. <laughs> I don't want that stuff. I want to be able to live. Well, I, I mean, I shouldn't say all marijuana because they gave them paychecks and, and then marijuana. And then they wondered, why are they showing up late? And why are they not good workers? <laughs> I came, that job's the one I came into. It was a painting job. That, that job's the job I came into work one day. And I said, where was everybody at? And he goes, I fired them all. And he's like, you do a better job than all of them put together. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know how to paint. I mean, you just put the paint on the wall, but there's all the other things, you know. 
If you just put, let me just give you some experience, some wisdom from experience. If you just go put paint on a wall, it's going to come back off. I'm, I'm just saying, you've got to do a lot of prep work, which is, as painters know, the most important work is the prep work, and it's the longest and most tedious work. But anyways, I, I, besides that, I mean, it, it, it's, you begin to get away from the Lord. You begin to, it's easy to get that pull, and I don't even know why I told you about that job, because the one I was going to tell you about was the different job when I was working in construction, and some of the crew, we were all Christians, on the crew, and some of the crew started cussing, and I would start cussing with them, and we were slipping, and I finally got to the point where I had to repent, and I had to come into the crew and tell them, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm sorry, and I apologize. As a Christian, I'm misrepresenting God by using language like that. And they were just like, they didn't want to say anything. They didn't want to say, you're right, we shouldn't either, but the language really cleaned up pretty quick around the job site, so it was interesting. But we go through, the, through these walks in life, and, and, and it's easier to slip away. So, so like leprosy, sin separates us from fellowship. Fellowship with the church, fellowship with loved ones, fellowship with spiritually healthy people. Which, man, I don't know about you, but after being in the world all week, it's refreshing to get together with some spiritually healthy people and hear some things that are true and that are right and holy and encourage one another. I love that. I love that. So... So, but most importantly, sin separates us from God. I mean, the most important relationship in our life and from God's word and separates us from the Holy Spirit. It begins to drive a wedge between ourselves and the Holy Spirit. And the thing that we need most in this life is not to be comfortable, it's not to have things, it's not to get more money. The thing we need most in this life is to be close to God, to be close to the healer of leprosy, to be close to the one who can, through his word, show us as in a mirror what we need to change and what we need to work on and how we need to grow in this life. That's what we need. So it separates us from that presence and we need to be close to him. We need to hear from him. We need to feel, to feel his presence. I don't know about you guys. I don't know when the last time it was that you just felt the presence of God. I hope it wasn't too long ago. For me, it was like 6 o'clock this morning, and I was on a pile on the floor in my living room. So if you ever come over to my house at 6 in the morning, there's either going to be a snooze festival going on, or there's going to be crazy, weird Isaac man praising God in the middle of his living room in his underwear. So don't picture that. Please just take that out of your mind. But I did have some coffee, and that was great. And I was wearing shorts and a shirt. It wasn't, it wasn't what you thought. Come on, guys. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. But it's so, it's so important just to know he's there and just to hear that little word and just to feel that presence of God in our lives. It's, to me, it's the, it's the, it's the breath in my, in my being that says I can keep going on. I can keep doing what I'm doing because I know God is with me. And if God is for me, then who can be against me? And even though we do have enemies and adversaries, I still go, it's okay because God's for me. Yes. Anyways. And I can say with certainty, with all certainty, that separation from God or broken communion with God is death. And if you think about that for a minute, it's, it's a literal fact. To be separated from God is to be dead. He is the life giver, the life breather. And we know that especially in the eternal view, to be separated from God is hell. It's eternal separation. It's death. It is our need to be close, not to be toying with sin. Amen? So in the re-quoted words of Pastor Chuck, I'm sure he stole this from somebody because that's what pastors do. They steal things from other pastors and it's, it's a holy form of thievery. But it says, this book will keep you from sin and sin will keep you from this book. And it's speaking, of course, of the Bible, the Word of God. So we need to be in it. And be an influence in other people's lives. I know this isn't in my notes and it's not a point that I was going to make, but I got to share with somebody yesterday and this morning he got up and read his Bible and I thought, for me to influence somebody to read the Word of God in the morning, yes! Thank you, Lord, for that being that little bit of salt in the world. Anyways, this week we're going to look at the ceremony for the cleansing of leprosy. And so this ceremony in itself, it's a little fact of information here, the ceremony itself did not cleanse the leper. So in other words, if there was a leper colony 
outside of the, t- of the city. A priest couldn't go out and do the ceremony and one at a time cleanse all the lepers. The ceremony didn't cleanse. It was done sort of as a memorial for the healing which had to be done by God. So the fact of the matter is none of us are healed of anything apart from God. It's Him. He's the healer. It's the grace of God which heals us of anything we're healed from in our lives. But especially, none of us are healed from the effects of sin and death except by God. We cannot heal ourselves. You cannot be good enough to make it to heaven. It's only through the work of Jesus Christ. So let's look at chapter 14 and ask God to show us what He has for us in in our lives this week as we open His Word. Amen? Chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priests, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him, and indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, So the clean birds, which really means of any kind of the birds that are clean, we're already determined, so you can't bring like a crow or like an eagle or something like that. It's got to be one of the clean birds, clean for eating. It's got to be a dove, a pigeon, some quail. I have to look back. Did he say anything about ducks? I don't know. At Christmas, you know, if you blow the Thanksgiving turkey, you can go eat some duck at the Chinese restaurant. Sorry, movie reference. Okay, so then, he, then you have to get, so two living and clean birds. Then you have to get cedar wood and scarlet, which would be a scarlet thread or yarn or a, a, some scarlet wool, and hyssop, okay? So I want to draw your attention quickly to, uh, to verse 2, the second half of verse 2 and the beginning half of, of verse 3. It says, he shall be brought to the priests. And the priest shall go out of the camp. So really, quite simply, the leper is, is brought basically to the outside of the city but, or, or the camp, and the priest has to go outside. He can't bring the leper inside the camp, or which would be the city. He's still unclean. So the priest has to go out of the camp to meet him and to, according to the text we just look at, examine him. And <clears throat> so the thought <clears throat> is though we're not to... Though, though we're not to the description, gosh, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm stumbling over my note here. Uh, we're not to the description of what the ceremony is yet. There is a rabbinical tradition that says that the ceremony happened at the gate of the city, and the priest was standing on the inside of the gate, and the leper outside of the gate. I mean, it's just a, a, a rabbinical tradition. We're not sure if that's exactly how it happened, but we do know that the priest had to come out uh, of the camp to meet him there. And if the leper is healed, then verse 4 says the priest is to gather up this list of things, which we're going to look at in a moment what they mean, and they're going to point to Christ. So he's to gather up the birds, uh, the wood, the, sc- the s- scarlet, and the hyssop. Okay, so now what he does with the things begins here in verse 5. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. So we have... This picture here of the, the two birds. And they take, he takes this first bird in verse 5, and he kills it inside of an earthen vessel over running water. So we kind of have a weird picture going on here, okay? So an earthen vessel is basically a pot. And, and you take the first bird, and you kill it in the pot, which is interesting. But it's going to point to something we're going to look at here. The picture that we have of Jesus is here in this first dove is that the dove was to be placed in this earthen vessel and to be killed over the running water. 
Now, first of all, like I said, and like I kind of mentioned, a dove has no business being in a pot. You don't keep birds in a pot. You know, you keep cookies in a pot or something else, right? Biscuits in a pot, cereal in a pot, something else. You, don't, you stew in a pot. You don't keep dove in a pot. You don't keep birds in a pot. Birds belong in the air. They belong in the heavens. And so right there, the light goes on. It's a picture of Jesus. It was Jesus who was in the beginning with God. And he was God. And nothing that is made was made without him. In other words, he created all that we see. Jesus, the word, was God and was with God. But he had to become flesh. He had to come to the earth and to live in the earthen vessel in order to die for us. Interesting picture being painted. Uh, Really, to me, a beautiful picture being painted. He couldn't have died. He couldn't have come down in his eternal form and died because he's eternal and it's impossible. So in order to die for our cleansing, he had to become flesh. He had to take on flesh. And that just makes me step back for a minute and go, wow, the love of God. That he would become a human, in order to die. And so not only that, that picture of his deity coming in an earthen vessel, but also a picture of one dying for the cleansing of the leper. So that, that this one, this impure, this gross person could be cleansed. And when you think about that, what an amazing picture of us. And we're going to keep coming back and touching to that. A sinful state, a sinful messed up person, that this perfection would come into an earthen vessel and find treasure, something of value in a messed up person. I can't get it right. That is amazing. It blows my mind. Also in verse 5, it talks about the running water, which... It's kind of self-explanatory. You might think that the water, that the bird was in the pot and they're standing over a stream or something, running water underneath, but really the picture is that the water is from running water in the pot. So you take the pot and you get some water from either a spring, which sometimes was known as living water, or you take it from a, a stream or a river, somewhere where the water's flowing. You can't take it from a cistern. You can't get old water out of a pot out in the backyard or whatever. It, it's it's got to be that living, that running water. And the bird was killed in the vessel, and the blood would drip into and mix with the living water. And another interesting picture. And this picture, it could be of the work of the blood and the word, The cleansing that comes from the blood and the word, the washing in the water of the word, or it could be a picture of the blood and the water is also the spirit sometimes in the word. If you remember the water that Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, when he said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So it could be a a picture of the blood and the spirit. But really, either way, the blood and the water flowing is something that we do see in the offering of the one true Lamb of God, right? Blood and water mixed together. Can you think of where it came from? It was at the cross, right? It was at his side, absolutely. As the soldiers were coming around and they were breaking the legs of the other criminals in order that they would be... They would die faster as to not be there at the Passover. And they came to Jesus and he appeared to be dead. And that the prophecy would be fulfilled that none of his bones would be broken instead of breaking his legs. To be sure, the guard took his spear and he put it into his side. And he punctured his heart. And the water that was around his heart in the pericardium and the blood from his heart flowed out. And we see this mixing of water and blood. So in verse 6, look with me at verse 6. He says, As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on this leprous man or woman, and it shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. So we have a whole another picture here. 
of this cleansing. And I'm going to put another picture up here for, for you guys to check out for a minute. But they take... <clears throat> they would take this living bird and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and they'd, they'd dip it all into an earthen vessel into the blood and water. And from what it appears to me, they would take all of the items and use them to sprinkle the blood on the leprous person. So like they get, I don't know if they tied the bird to the stick. I mean, that's just an artist's rendering. But they take all these things, the hyssop and the, the cedar board or stick or whatever it was, and the dove, and the scarlet thread. Maybe they used the scarlet thread to tie them, like the picture, I don't know. But they dip the whole thing, and then they're like, I don't know, it's just kind of funny, but they're like dripping the, lo the blood and the water off of the bird, shaking it on the guy seven times. So it's part of this cleansing ritual, this, this ceremony. And, and you think, man, what does all this mean? What do all these items represent? Well, let's look in verse 6. The first thing that I want to look at is the living bird dipped in the blood. And it represents a few things. The first thing, the life of the leper now cleansed and he's, he's free. And I was thinking about this, about how you don't know how free you are until your freedom's taken away. And what a picture as this leper is coming and he's being cleansed and he realizes he's going to be free again. Free to live life like he used to, like he knew before, and before this leprosy had come into his life. And I don't know how long that had been or whatever, but it's just one of those things where you're going, I can't believe this is happening. I cannot believe that I'm going to be free. And so this, this bird is a picture of that freedom as it goes away, as it flies away into the air free with blood upon it. And that's why when I think of you know, n not knowing how free you are until your freedom is taken away. I think that's why I ground my children. Every once in a while I tell them, you think you're free? You're grounded! No, I'm just kidding. And I, I, sometimes I do that, but I usually don't. I ground, I'm going to try to be a good parent. I ground them when they need it, not when I feel like they need to learn a lesson. But yes, that's, I'm sorry, they do need to learn a lesson. That's why I ground them. Anyways, let, let's get back to what we're looking at here. The second thing is that it's a reminder of the cleansing we've received through the blood of sacrifice and the freedom that we now have in Christ. The cleansing that we've received through that blood of sacrifice and the freedom that we now have in Christ. And as the bird flies free in the heavens, it's another reminder that, of what we are to do now after we've been cleansed, after we have been cleansed from the leprosy of sin. We're to soar, we're to fly in the heavens, not to go back to the leper colony, not to go back to the old sin, or to go back to the earth, or the dirt, or the dust, or the world, but to remain close to Jesus, the one who has freed us. Amen? And the third picture that we see in this second dove is the picture of Jesus. And really, both birds are a picture of Christ. The first one is that he died for the cleansing of the leper, but also the one who flies free with the, br with the blood, excuse me, is a picture of really the rest of the story, or in this case, the rest of the gospel. The gospel doesn't stop where Jesus died for our sins, he was also buried for three days, and then what? He rose again. It's one of the best, most powerful parts of the gospel. That we've been cleansed from our sin, but he rose to verify. And so this blood on this free dove, one of the commentaries I went through said, it's a picture of the blood of the Lamb that was taken to the throne room of heaven and presented and accepted as the sacrifice for mankind. And when I, <clears throat> when I think about this picture that's painted, you know, Jesus didn't literally take blood to the throne room of heaven, but there is an altar in heaven. And we know that Jesus is the sacrifice. He's the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And we also know that he's the only sacrifice that is now accepted. Jesus is the only sacrifice that is now accepted. All other sacrifices offered for our righteousness are an offense to the work of the cross. To come to God some other way, either with our own righteousness or some other method of saying, this is how I'm righteous, besides the cross, is an offense to God. 
to what he's done. <laughs> I remember at one of the uh, summer camps I, we took the kids to in California, we, it, there was a, a teacher on there, and he was talking about how if I wanted to give you a Rolex, right, something that you could never afford to this high school kid, I'm going to give you this Rolex. And you said, oh, no, 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 dude, I, you can't just give that to me. Here, here's $3. I was going to use it for the snack bar, but here's 3 bucks. It would be like an insult, right? What? This is a $4,000 watch. You're not giving me $3. Give me my watch back. You know, it's kind of that thing. And it's the same kind of idea when we try to come to God with some measly change of our good works. It's an offense to God. And so we have this picture, an amazing picture, of what Christ has done for us and the finished work of the cross and the resurrection, all of these things. So back to that text, carrying on with the, the last three of our items. The first one uh, on the next three, so item number two, if that's not confusing enough, is the cedar wood. And, and this represented a couple of things. The nature of cedar wood was that it's, it's highly resistant to pestilence and rot. So it's highly resistant to bugs and infestation. It's resistant to rot. And I think that could have been significant to a leper to think that that's something I don't want in my life anymore. I'm done with the rotting part. That was bad and the infestation. <clears throat> Another picture through this wood is, of course, the obvious one, the wood of the cross that would represent the cross that Jesus would die for us. But one commentary said that some scholars even believe that the crosses used in the Roman times were cedar. Uh, we're not exactly sure, but that was an interesting thought. The next item we see is the scarlet, which represents a couple of things. One commentary, of course, actually most of them said it represents the blood of Christ, the blood of sacrifice. And I automatically think of the scarlet thread that runs throughout the scripture. And I remember Rick doing a study on the scarlet thread not too long ago and seeing that scarlet thread representing the blood of Christ throughout all of these places. Well, here's another one. And another commentary said that it represents the color of the person coming back into them through this cleansing. So if you could think of the leper losing his color or maybe the, the pigment in their skin, that this restoration, that this scarlet would represent your color coming back to, into your life, into your body, and the restoring of Christ. And then, of course, the, the fourth one, last but not least, is the hyssop. And there's a few things that come to my mind when I think about hyssop. <clears throat> As you probably do, the first one that I think of is Jesus because it was on the cross. And the Gospel of John tells us that they put the sponge on hyssop and they offered it to Jesus. So we've got the hyssop used there at the cross, at the sacrifice of the lamb. And also David refers to hyssop in Psalm 51, a, a psalm of mourning and grieving. And he's, he says, purge me with hyssop as he was admitting, basically before the Lord, that I am as bad as a leper. My sin is as bad as a leper. And, of course, we see a really good comparison in the life of David. I really didn't touch on. But in the life of David, that picture of, of the, the leprosy of sin growing from something small to something big, if you remember the story, that time with Bathsheba, the first thing was he was supposed to go out to battle with his men. But what did he do? He stayed home. It gave him some idle time, some downtime. He didn't go out with his men. And then he ended up being on the rooftop. And then he ended up looking. And then he ended up lusting. And then he ended up acting. And then he ended up murdering and lying. And those things that happen in his life. And so here he is, broken, saying, Purge me, God, as with hyssop. Because I'm just like a leper. And I need your cleansing. And man, doesn't that paint the picture of us in our lives? And then what kind of, in my mind, ties all of this together with the hyssop? The place that I think of the hyssop the most in the Bible was at the Passover because it was the reed that was used to apply the blood to the doorpost. They took a, a bunch of hyssop and they dipped it in the blood of the lamb and they applied it to the doorpost. So it's associated with our cleansing, with the application of the blood, which, like David said, purges us. And the blood, the blood washes us like nothing else can wash. 
cleanses us from our unrighteousness. And all I can say to that is, God, let there be hyssop and blood in my life. Let it be a real thing. And if the hyssop is the humble plant that you use to apply the blood, then let it be in my life. Let it be upon me. And let me also be hyssop to somebody else that I would be used to lead, lead someone else to apply this precious blood to their life. It's one of the highest things you can do while you're alive on this earth is to lead someone to Christ and allow them to be washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? So man, we've got some amazing, awesome pictures and all these things have these meanings and they all are going to point to Jesus. And I love it because it's the truth that in the entirety of the book of the scripture, it's written of him. Verse 8. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave all of his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that he shall come into the camp and shall stay outside of his tent for seven days. But on the seventh day he shall shave all the hair of his, off his head and his beard and his eyebrows. All his hair he shall shave off. And he shall wash his clothes and wash his body in water and he shall be clean. So we have these, this, this picture of this leper who's coming in. He, he washes his clothes after the ceremony. And of course, I mean, he's going to have some blood. The blood was sprinkled seven times. And, and of course, well, we don't know exactly, but from what we understand, some of this rotting leprosy, man, it smelled bad. And so he's going to go in and he's going to wash and he's going to wash his clothes and he's going to wash his, he's, he's going to shave and he's going to wash himself and then he's going to come into the camp but he's going to stay outside of his tent. And then in verse 9, on the seventh day, he's going to shave again all of his hair, including his beard and his eyebrows. I don't know if you've ever done something dumb and like burned your eyebrows off your face or anything like that. But it's always weird to look at yourself and not have eyebrows. I saw a uh, little Facebook post that was interesting where this guy fell asleep on a couch and his buddy came up and waxed his eyebrows in his sleep. I don't know if you guys... It was interesting, but it did look really weird. I think it was like computer fake. I don't, you know what I mean? But all I know is when you're in those leprous camps and of those horrible parties, things like that happen in real life. Just, just saying. You pass out on a couch, you never know. So just stay out of that, all right? Let's get close to Jesus. Leave that old life behind. And we don't have to worry about that stuff. <clears throat> so, of course, there's, there's these pictures of this washing, this cleansing, this shaving, which really, it just it paints the perfect picture of a fresh new start, a clean start. And to us, it's the picture of being cleansed being careful to remove all of the unclean things that used to be in our life, being careful to wash at our time of cleansing, at our time of repentance or coming back, being careful to say, God, what was it that pulled me away because I don't want to go down this road again? And, and beginning to move those things out and to remain separate from this deadly disease of sin. It's a picture of being born again, getting a whole new start, a fresh baldness, smooth baldness to your life. Well, that's kind of funny, but a fresh start, being restored, not only with the cleansing that he received, but now he gets to come back into the camp, into the church, being restored in fellowship with his family. I always think of these leprous people and the family that they can't see anymore because they're, they're out there in that place of uncleanness, and now they can be restored to this health, and to this spiritual wellness in their life. So now we go on to the sacrifice offered to God on the eighth day for the leper. You know what? Before we go on to the sacrifice, I have to mention this. I forgot to put it in my notes. But we have this whole section on this ritual of the cleansing of the leper, and not one time in the Old Testament is there an account of it ever being used ever being used. It just wasn't in there. There was a couple of people in the Old Testament that got cleansed of leprosy. There was a, there was a, a, a general in an army, I think it was a Syrian army, and I can't remember his name, but he came looking for the, the king of Jerusalem, and he ended up going to Elisha, and Elisha was busy, and Elisha sent his servant, told him, just tell that guy to go wash seven times in the Jordan. And so he went and told the guy, and the guy was like, he got mad. 
I said, man, we got better rivers in the Jordan where I'm from. If I was just going to wash, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And his servant said, hey, this is a prophet of the Most High God. Just, why don't you just give it a shot? Why don't you just try it? And if you remember the story, he went and washed seven times, and he was cleansed. And he wanted to go pay Elisha. And Elisha didn't take the money. But remember the story, his servant took the money. And what happened to his servant? He got the leprosy. So, bad deal for him. But there are cleansings. There was a washing seven times, but there's no time when the priests went and acted this thing out. It was just in the books. I mean, you could imagine. It's just covered in two inches of dust. Until... One day, when this carpenter showed up, from Jesus from Nazareth, right? And he began to heal people and cleanse them of leprosy. And, and then what he would tell them is, hey, go down to the... He wouldn't, he would, he'd tell them, no, don't tell anybody, just go down to the, the priests and tell them you've been cleansed of leprosy and you want the ceremony. And you could just imagine the, the priests going like, what? I, what is that? I think I've heard of it. I've never... No one's ever done it. How do you do it? You know, and figuring, getting the books out and dusting them off and going. And if you can't see the clear picture of the Messiah painted, all of a sudden the Messiah shows up at the right time and he begins cleansing people of leprosy. It's like a neon sign. Jesus is the Messiah. And the priests are going, I don't know what's happening. And they might have known a little more than we think they do, but... It's an amazing thing. Okay, so now we go on to where are we at? Verse 10. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, and one log of oil. And then t the priest who makes him clean shall present the man who is to be made clean, and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall take the one male lamb and offer it as a trespass offering and the log of oil, which the log of oil, Wayne asked me earlier what the log of oil was. And in, in the commentaries I went through, they said it was a measure, like about a quart of oil. Not Because in my mind, when I think of a log of oil, I immediately think of like a cheese log. I don't know why. <laughs> With the nuts on top. I'm just weird. So they're a holiday fave if you want one of those cheese logs. <clears throat> but this is a, a measure of oil. And he takes them and he waves them as a wave offering before the Lord. And then he shall kill the lamb in the place where he kills the sin offering and the burnt offering in a holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest's, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. So verse 14, And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who was to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of the right foot. So here we see this picture. He, they make a sacrifice, a sin sacrifice, a sin offering to the Lord on the eighth day. One of the things that I put in my notes here is eight is the number of new beginnings. It's the number of regeneration, of resurrection. And what does the leper do on his first day of freedom? He worships God in sacrifice. He offers this offering to be right with the Lord. And then, you know, and one of the, one of the thoughts is not just that he was a, a, a sinner because he was leprous, but he hasn't been able to worship. He's been separated. And so now he's going to come back and he's going to get right with the Lord, right? He's going to come back and with a, kind of with a bang, so to speak, and get right with the Lord and go all out. And then the blood is applied to his right, the tip of his right ear, to his right thumb, and his right big toe. And it's kind of interesting that with this new start, the, the symbolic, the symbolism says, I will give my ear to hear from God, and I'm going to give my hands to serve God, and I'm going to let my feet walk after the Lord. And, and it, to me, it just paints a beautiful, amazing picture of the blood-bought sinner, one who, who was a walking dead, but now has found the cleansing of Jesus Christ, and God is purchased with Jesus' blood. And the only thing that I can offer him of value is to give my life back to him, to offer it to him. And, and like Paul said, it's my reasonable service for all he's done for me, to just give my life as an offering as he has cleansed me. 
and made me clean in his blood. What an awesome picture. Then he goes on to verse 15, the oil, and the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it onto the palm of his own left hand, and the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil, that is, in his left hand, and, and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And verse 17, and the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest shall put some on the tip of his right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, or on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the trespass offering. So he puts this oil right over the top of the blood on the same places, and, and it's an awesome picture because after this blood is being applied, the oil is applied, and what's that oil a picture of? The Holy Spirit. It's a picture of the anointing of the Holy Spirit on his life. And I want, to make a, I want to draw your attention to something quickly. The order is important. You cannot have the anointing of the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Spirit of God inside of you without the blood of Jesus applied to your life. You can't do it. The reason I bring that up is because sometimes people say, well, I have my own relationship with God. And I talk to Him every day. Well, the bottom line is if you're not talking to Him by the shed blood of His offering then you're talking to the ceiling. You don't have a relationship with God. And so there's a purpose to this order. First the blood, then the Holy Spirit. And all that to say, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. And Jesus makes it clear in a, a few different places in the scripture that if you know him, then you've known the Father. And I, I, one of my favorites is in John 14, in verse 8, when Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And of course, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty straightforward, pretty clear. So just talking to God on a, you know, on a summer day out by the river doesn't cut it. You've got to come to it by his prescribed method, by his manner. So <clears throat> in verse 17, he goes on with the instruction to put that oil on the tip of the right ear, the right thumb, and the right great toe, King James Version. So again, that picture is the Holy Spirit upon the life of the cleansed leper in and upon every part of his life, the life of the saved believer who has been cleansed from his sin. And it's the only way to go, is to have the Holy Spirit on all of my life. The things that I intake into my life, the things that I do with my hands, and the, th the places I go with my feet, I want to be anointed, I want to be used by God in all of those places. Another thing to take note of is that though there is an order to this application, like I just mentioned, you still, you can't separate them either. Because the life of the washed and born again Christian is a life with the Holy Spirit. The life of a cleansed, blood-bought blood, blood Christian <laughs> is the life filled with the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, do you really have an assurance of your salvation? Because that's, that's it. To have His Spirit in me, I know. To have His life and His work and His, His Word and His Spirit flowing in my life, I know that I know that I know. I watched a thing on Facebook uh, yesterday that this guy was walking up and interviewing people that asked them all if they were Christians. They all said yes. Ask him, okay, well, if God says or if you went to heaven, if you died and went to heaven right now, would you go to heaven? And they all said, I don't know. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Man, what a hopeless thing. And what a lack of knowledge, of information, just to know that if you've accepted Christ, the answer is yes. And if you have that working of the Holy Spirit, that convicting, that drawing, that working of Him in your life, you have nothing to worry about. Just keep living for him and just keep listening to the Spirit and just keep walking according to what he's telling you to do and according to his word. And we're going <laughs> to, sooner or later, we're going to be there together. And it's going to be great. I cannot wait to be with you in heaven. I, I like being with you here. It's going to be way better in heaven. I'm not going to be the one talking. Praise God. It'll be Jesus. You'll be like, man, the donkey is quiet. Praise God. 
But wait, there's more with this anointing. Verse 18, And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hands he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed, so the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. So the rest of this oil that's left in this log of oil is poured over his head. He's anointed. He's, he's got a, and what's the picture of that? It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the life of the believer. And for me, this is the one that I go, this is the one. I mean, we want all of these things, but this is the one that I want in my life. I want the power of the Holy Spirit flowing over me. And everywhere I go, I'm bumping oil on people. That's what I want. And sometimes I'm lacking that in my life. Sometimes I have a grumpy flesh day. Today was pretty rough. I was a little tired all day long and having a hard time thinking and getting clear in my head. I don't know if you ever have one of those days and then have to study for Wednesday night teaching. On top of it, you're going, I don't know what I'm doing. Lord, it's going to have to be you. But I want that in my life, the baptism of the Spirit. So the Spirit has a few different works. The Spirit draws us to Him before we're saved. It draws people to Him. The Spirit also has an indwelling work where it lives, he comes and he lives inside of us, a cleansing work. And then there's what this is described as, this pouring on of the Holy Spirit. It's the upon, the overflowing. And that's what this picture is of. A fresh outpour of the Holy Spirit overflowing the cup, the earthen vessel, of the life of the believer. It's something we need. It's something we want. We should want. I hope that we want it. I hope that we say, Lord, I don't want to leave this place until I've been filled with your Spirit. I need your Spirit like breath in my lungs. And then you think about all this stuff, and you think about this whole scene, and what just happened, the blood being applied, the ear, the thumb, the toe, the oil, the pouring of, and I think I, think I just heard this a few chapters ago. You guys remember what I'm talking about? This is what happened when they would anoint the priests. And they just did it a few chapters back. They anointed the priest. So that brings us to an, a, a different point here. There are four people total in the scriptures that get this anointing. The first one is the priests. The priests are the ones who represent God before the people, and they represent the people on behalf of the people to God, before God. The intercessor. The second is the kings, and the kings were supposed to, especially in Israel, at this point they don't have kings, they're not going to have them for a while, but when they do, they're supposed to lead them in a godly way. They're supposed to lead them in the ways of the Lord. So the kings had a big role. And then the prophets. And the prophets were the ones who were to speak the word of God to the people. Again, they have a, a large role. And of course, the last one there is the leper. The cleansing of the leper. All these people have these places of prestige and honor and, and kind of reverence as they're working for God on behalf of God. And then among all of this is the lowly leper. And to tell you the truth, when I think about this and when I hear this, I think I relate more to the leper than anyone else. Because I look at the life of the leper and I say, that was me before I had the Lord. I was lost. I was rotten. I was hurting. I was separate. I feel like I don't have anything that I can offer God. All, all I can do is cry out to him for cleansing. Is cry out to him and say, I need you, God. I'm messed up. But a leper isn't just a lowly thing. And if you're like me and you identify with the leper more than anything, and I, I don't feel like a king, I don't feel like a priest, I don't feel like a prophet, usually my foot's in my mouth, I feel like a leper. And if you're identifying like that, it's not just a lowly thing. It's really the greatest picture of God's extended grace to the least and the lowly. And he gives them the same treatment as the kings, as the prophets. And when I see that picture of God's grace in my life, I think, man, that should be such a beautiful, bright picture as we walk through this life. And we get to tell people our story and say, I used to be a leper. I used to have to say, get away from me. I'm contagious. Cover my mustache and yell. Ah, oy vey. And now I'm in a place of closeness and relationship with Jesus. And all I have to do as a leper is show up. A sinner, an outcast is show up and he cleanses me and he restores me and he gives me a fresh, clean start and a new filling of his spirit. 
I'm so thankful for the picture that God has put in the Old Testament of the leper and the cleansing. And we have a high priest who comes to us to cleanse us, and his name is Jesus. And all we have to do is accept his work. And if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 17, I think we're going to close right here in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. And we're just going to look, just for a moment, at the story of Jesus, the history, I should say, of Jesus cleansing the ten lepers, just for a moment. So Luke chapter 17, verse 11. It says, Now what happened is he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Verse 12. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And so when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he returned with a loud voice and glorified God and fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a what? He was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. So we see some interesting pictures in this passage of the lepers. And the first thing was, all they really had to do was cry out to Jesus. And after they cry out to Jesus, he says to them, go and show yourselves to the priest, and here's the faith laid out. They had to walk. And they weren't cleansed at this point. If you look at the scripture there, they weren't cleansed, but it says there in verse 14, and so it was that as they went, as they believed what God's word said, and began to walk in the direction that Jesus told them to, he healed them. Isn't that true in our lives? That it, we don't have to understand all of it. it. It might take days, it might take weeks, months, it might take years. But as we walk and follow him, he's doing a cleansing and a restoring in our lives. And it's crazy. So they went and they were, they, they, to the priest, they showed themselves. And here's one example of ten guys in a row coming down to the priest and saying, Hey, I need the cleansing thing to happen. And they're like, What? You guys are cleansed of leprosy. I've never even, what? What do I have to do? Something about boids and a plank and some blood. I don't know. Oy vey. You know, they're, they're throwing a fit here. But the priests nonetheless have to do this ritual and cleanse the, uh, the ceremony of the cleansing. And, and, the, and the most amazing part of the story to me, verse 15, the one that was healed, he returned. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. And, and really, isn't that, I mean, isn't that it? Isn't that what it should be in our lives? God has healed us, and with a loud voice, we should be coming back to him and worshiping. And we should stay close to him and worship. But here we have, and he is a, he's an outsider, he's a Samaritan. But here we have these nine, and we just, we don't really know, but we kind of expect that they're Jewish. And we have these nine who are ungrateful, but Jesus doesn't just notice the Samaritan who came and fell at his feet, but he also, in verse 17, he noticed where are the other nine who aren't worshiping? He notices when we don't give him the glory that's due him. He notices when we don't praise him. He takes a note of that. And he says, only this foreigner return. And, and, and so I think of us as Christians, I, for some reason I get this picture in my head of Christians that believe in God and, and whatever, and they, and they just kind of don't go to church, and, and you're like, you see them maybe, maybe they used to come here or whatever, you see them in the store, and you go, hey man, where are you going to church? And for me, the biggest response is like, oh, I should go to Calvary Chapel. I'm like, when? Because I'm there a lot, I don't know, where, I never saw you in a long time. 
You know, I, I don't try to be like, oh, I, I, but my heart is to say, man, are, are you in fellowship? Because you need to be in fellowship. And I don't care if it's here. I just hope it's a Bible teaching. I pray you go to a Bible teaching church that's just speaking the truth of God's word into your life. But you need to be, and the, the point isn't just the congregation. The point is that you're coming back to the one who healed you with the people that are healed, with lepers that are cleansed, and you're praising the one who saved your life. He's worthy of it. I mean, and it makes me sad when people just live their own lives and they float out and they don't give God that praise and they don't come together and they don't worship Him in their life because He is worthy and He took this life. <coughs> and He breathed the breath of life back into it and I'm so thankful. I don't want to go away. I don't want to be further away. I want to be closer every day. Amen? So let's all stand together and we'll pray. We're going to have to pick it up in verse 19. I, there's just too much good stuff here in that beginning part. Because the, I think there's like 50 something verses. So, But God, we come to you tonight and we're, thank, we're so thankful, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. And we're so thankful that you are the, the healer. You're the cleanser. You're the one who, who can take this lousy leper and treat him like a king because of your goodness and your grace. I'm so thankful for that in my life and I'm so thankful tonight for these that would come and worship the one who's worthy, the one who's taken away our sins and our stains. And we believe that by faith. And we know that we're not all the way healed. In fact, we know we're going to see some more pictures just a little bit further down the line in the scripture of us continuing to have to clean and while we're here in this earth and on this, living in this tent, we're going to have to keep cleaning. If we stop cleaning, it'd be a smelly thing. But we want to keep cleaning and being close to you, God, and being thankful and living lives of praise to you. You're worthy of it. So we thank you. Help us to go out and be a light, a, a story of grace, of a life that was changed by the love and the blood of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.